I think it's around here. It's around here somewhere. It's definitely, it's definitely around here somewhere. I think, I think it's there. I think it's there. Oh, we found it. We have found it. So happy we finally found that. That is my favorite part of the Gold Coast. I've been away for five years, so it took me a little while to find it. There's a few little places you gotta sort of crawl yourself through, but we finally got there and uh, for good reason. It's, it's unreal. You can sit there for hours, watch the sun rise, watch the sun set. It's definitely my favorite part of the Gold Coast. Um, you're probably thinking, why did I actually bother to show you that today? Well, it's Q&A day. You've got questions and I've got answers. And show me your pixels, ask me the question, what is your favorite part of the Gold Coast? And that was it. Cock Rock, Burley Heads. Obviously, Cock Rock, you get the picture as to why. But uh, that is no doubt about it, my favorite part. Um, I've got a few more questions and I want to answer them, but I'm going to do that back home and jump into the hot desk. So I'm going to shoot back. I'll see you back there. I'll run some B-roll of the Gold Coast uh, to give you a bit of a look around before we get there. Um, we'll see you soon. I wish to be someone better to help me with this comparison. Hey guys, welcome back. Woo. Q and A day. I'm pretty excited for Q and A day. It's something different for the channel. We haven't done this before. And if you do get any enjoyment out of it, let me know by hitting the like button. But I'm pretty excited about this. I've gone ahead and I put out a poll or a questionnaire, I guess, on my Instagram the other day, just yesterday. And I asked for any questions at all. It could be reselling related, personal related, anything. I'm an open book today. And I'm happy to answer any of the questions that you guys submit. And we did get quite a number of uh, questions submitted, which was awesome. I haven't been able to answer every single one in this video, but I will try and get back to you personally. So a big thank you to everyone that left a question. Uh, on Instagram, but um, I'll go ahead and I'll quickly answer as many as I can today. I don't want to ramble on on any of these. I just want to get through them as quickly as I possibly can. So we'll kick things off with the very first question from El Sexo Machino. I hope I've got that pronunciation right. Sorry if I um, stuff any of these ones up. What are the best tools for determining the value of an item? Well, the best tools for me are just simply using the eBay filtered sold searches. That's really all I do. When I'm out uh, in the thrift, um, I'm using eBay, I'm doing the filtered search and I'm seeing what the sell through rate is like um, based on that alone. And if it's furniture, there's not so much a comp that I can work off on any platform. Um, so I'll just, I'll do some research around some retail pricing. And I think retail pricing across the board is a really good thing to do. Get a gauge on what it costs new and then try and find a used, um, you know, past sales history as well, wherever you can. But generally for me as an eBay seller, I find that doing the comps uh, on eBay is the best way to gauge um, the correct price um, for my item. But um, if you're using other sort of sales platforms, I still think eBay comp sold is, is a really good way to go about it too. You don't have to be selling on the platform to use the comps. Um, you can still check it out and, uh, and then sell on Poshmark, Macari, whatever the case may be, wherever you sell. So um, pretty straightforward that one for me. Ballangarry Flips has a question as well. I'll put it up here for you to have a look at. Uh, question here we've got is best way to track your expenses. 
keep your receipts and then transfer to the spreadsheet. Uh, well, firstly, everything is done in my spreadsheet. I've got a master document that tracks expenses and it tracks all of my sales. So it's all sort of kept in the one place and I think that's the most efficient way of doing it. I am looking at it and attending to it literally each and every day, almost by the hour. Um, I'm forever looking at it, but I think that's a good thing. I think you should be on top of your numbers and you should be having some form of fine-tuned setup that works for you. For me, a master document just does that. I don't need to go searching for places. I know that I can find it all in the one spot. Uh, I don't use any other form of software. It is a plain and simple Excel document. Um, later on down the track when things start to evolve, who knows where that will go. But for now, um, you know, sourcing 250 items, making 130 sales, I'm just attending, as soon as the sale comes in, I'm putting it into my spreadsheet. And as soon as I go and buy stuff in the thrift store, I'm putting it into the spreadsheet. It, it gets attended to immediately, and that's how you stay on top of it. Um, and how do I keep my receipts? I just bundle them with a rubber band. I keep track of them and, and keep them all, um, but I just bundle them up and put them in a, uh, in a folder. They're just, they're just tucked away for tax time. So um, yeah, I, I don't really take much notice of them. Uh, I'll, I'll cross-reference my postage into my spreadsheet once that's done. Um, but then I'll rubber band them up, put them in the folder, attend to them at tax time. Next question comes from Yeah Rare, and Yeah Rare says, I see you sell some items for $50 at $49.97, for example. How does this work over, say, the traditional tactic of $49.99 and why? For me, I know and have always known that $49.99 gets you lower than the $50 options in the search history. So if you're searching for an item and you've got five items up for $50, obviously the $49.99 will pop up first for those that search for the lower sold. Um, I wanna beat those people. So rather than going for 48, I go 47 because seven is my lucky number. Um, there's no real method or madness to it. It's just that 47 is my lucky or 97 is my lucky, whatever the case may be as long as it's got a seven in it. And uh, that way I feel like it pops up in the search as me being the cheapest option um, to those that are pretty much the same price as me. Next question comes from Inspector Trash. And Inspector Trash says, how long did it take you to hit 1,000 subs on YouTube? Well, 1,000 subs on YouTube took me about four months and three weeks. Uh, I think it was about 142 days or something like that. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, it doesn't just happen. You've got to put in literally hours every single day to it. Um, I've got a video that I've put up that shows how I got to a thousand subscribers. So if you're interested in checking out that video, uh, I'll put a link up here for you to click on now. Um, but yeah, there was a bit of a strategy that I went into it with and fortunately it was able to pay off and get me there within the space of just four months and three weeks. But uh, I think YouTube recommends or, or suggests that it'll take between 12 to 18 months um, to get monetized with 1,000 subs and 4,000 watch hours. And I think it took me about five months all up to, uh, to get monetized. So definitely a big goal of mine. I'm really stoked to be able to be here with 1,300 old at the moment and, uh, and been able to achieve it. But um, definitely check out my video if you've got a YouTube channel and you wanna get 1,000 subs yourself. Next question is from C.L. Furlong. My good mate, Chris Furlong, uh, where is your time most spent and where would you like to gain more efficiency? Also, how is the running going? Well, firstly, I'll start with the running. It's not going well at all. Um, for those that don't know, uh, I'm a long distance runner or I like to go long distance running quite regularly. It's something that I've done for the last 15 years, but really in the past three months, I've, I've broken down with some bad hip and knee and, uh, and back pain. And um, it's been keeping me out of the game in the running front for quite a while. And I did hope that I'd be back up and running for the start of January, but um, I don't think that's gonna be the case because I'm still incredibly sore at the moment. Um, I'm doing a lot of stretching, so, so running has been put on the back burner, but that, uh, that gives me more time to, uh, to do some reselling. So time most spent. Uh, time most spent, I really try to keep everything sort of even and turning over in the sense of my time. I don't actually like to get caught up doing one thing for too long. I really try and kind of spread evenly as across every single facet of what we need to do to get the job done with this game. Um, so if I'm, if I'm thrifting, if I'm listing, if I'm doing YouTube, if I'm cleaning, um, whatever the case may be, I try to make sure that I plan my day out at the beginning of the day with the most important tasks. Um, so I might even do a video on sort of how I go about my week and, uh, or even just a day. Um, but really like if postage is the major concern because I've got so many orders that have just come in, postage is the priority. But once that's done, I don't look at anything with regards to postage you know, until the next time it needs to be done. 
Um, if I'm needing to list, uh, then listing is, is ultimately always the priority to try and get 15 items up listed each and every day. Um, I need to probably start to make that the priority for the first thing in the morning each and every day, just get it done. Um, because I think that's the biggest way to get successful on eBay is to just keep listing. Um, so I need to probably keep doing that. But once that's done, I don't want to be listing at any other point in the day. I want to be ticking off other things and getting other things done. So time most spent, um, it's pretty much everything, pretty much everything evenly. And as for efficiencies, uh, I would say probably the biggest one would be YouTube. I really want to get quicker, uh, more efficient basically with YouTube. Uh, it takes about five hours to put up a video each and every time. And if I can, having done this for a little bit longer, get it down to a four hour process, that's going to give me more time to actually get on with the reselling, which is what I talk about obviously on YouTube. But I really want to keep making sure both components um, you know, work in, in the sense of getting the reselling results and also the three videos every single week. But if I can make things you know, sped up by being more efficient on the YouTube front, it will just allow me to succeed more in, uh, in the reselling side of things. So definitely better at editing, um, just getting quicker at the process of planning, shooting, and publishing a YouTube video. Next question's up, and there's quite a few of them here. Reselling Wonders has thrown a heap of questions at me, and I'm gonna do my best to answer them all. Um, first one that I've got here, why do you always offer free post? I know some people like that, uh, build that into the cost, but would you ever consider adding postage to the sale to max your profit? I look, I, my personal opinion is that free postage generates more sales. And I might be wrong, I don't know if there's any true data that shows that, but my just pure business mind thinks that if you're looking at something with free postage, you're more of a chance to buy it than somebody that has a postage charge. I do build in my price um, to the cost that I have when it's free postage. So if I wanna get $25 for it, I'll list the item for $32 uh, free postage, uh, allowing for the $7 in postage. So it certainly is something that I do. I do build it in, but it's just my personal opinion that uh, you should be adding in, um, you should be offering the free postage service to generate more sales. Um, I haven't really tried to test the waters by putting up a postage offer and, and getting people to charge for postage, but that might be a cool little experiment just to see how it goes. But that's just my opinion, it might be wrong, but I'll continue to do it because I think it works. Uh, next one was, what was the first item you ever flipped? Um, I actually flipped a car. Uh, I flipped a car about three or four years ago and uh, it sort of opened my eyes up to the process of doing this um, for more so an enjoyment factor. I've always been in sales and I've always been in sales for a company selling a product and then it sort of got me thinking when I sold the car, basically the story around that was I bought a, uh, I bought a car when I landed in Perth a few years ago, just needed a runaround for a very short term period. Uh, bought it for three thousand dollars. It was literally a runaround, and uh, within a year, I, I upgraded my car. Um, I was more settled in Perth, and I sold that car for four thousand dollars and made a grand. Um, so that really, like I said, it opened up my eyes. I thought maybe we could do this with other stuff. It doesn't necessarily need to be a car. What if it could be just something a bit smaller, a bit more manageable, uh, a bit more faster turnover? So that was when it all sort of first began, but I really didn't get back into the frame of reselling until the coronavirus hit. I knew of it, I knew how to do it. I had the background in sales, but it was that first uh, sort of flip of the car that got me into the, the mindset of doing this. And she also goes on to say, uh, what is your why? Why did you choose to go full-time reseller and what, uh, what got you started? Well, what got me started is I was living in Melbourne and the coronavirus hit and I decided to relocate back to the Gold Coast, somewhere that I haven't been, my hometown for over five years. So I really wanted to get back, but I had no job prospects. And rather than taking any old job, I thought if ever was gonna be the opportunity to give this thing a go, you know, full-time reselling, working for yourself, now would be the time to give it your absolute best. So that's really been me since about July, August of last year. It's been about six months now. I've been full-time, fully committed for about four to five months, and I am still absolutely loving it. But why I started, I really just had no choice. The coronavirus sort of forced me into it, but I still had a sales background. So I thought that I'd be able to have some success with this. And so far, it's not really so much the success because that will come. I think it's just the fact that I'm enjoying each day and I'm loving the process of working really hard to try and get the results and try and hit the goals that I've got set for myself. So that's sort of why I started. Um, the other question that you had there was, uh, why did you choose or why? So why did you choose to go full time? I chose to go full time because of the freedom aspect of being your own boss. I think that's just really cool. I mean, you've got 12 to 15 sort of hour working days. They are long days, but it's on your own 
time. You can do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And I've never sort of had that freedom before. And the last four months of having it, I don't want to let it go. I want to succeed so much so that I can just simply continue with the freedom that I'm having. And that would absolutely be the number one reason why I absolutely love doing this on a full-time basis. Um, and the last one, she said, uh, what are uh, the benefits of having a YouTube channel for you? Uh, but really just kind of sharing my story in, in the hope that it helps somebody else out there um, get into reselling is, is another big reason why I wanted to do this. It came at a time where I think a lot of people were out of work. Um, I started up this YouTube channel very much at the early stages of what I'm trying to do here with reselling. But I thought, you know, yes, I don't know everything, but I'm still eligible to pick up a camera and tell my story. And if that helps somebody out there, then that's why I'm going to keep making these videos. So yes, the monetization side of it is there. And that's a great plus that keeps you motivated to keep making videos. But to hear the comments and to hear the stories of everybody out there that's watching these videos and getting inspired in some way, shape or form, um, that's really exciting for me as well. That's a big motivator and I absolutely love hearing those stories. And it is the reason why I started this YouTube channel was to try and help people out there that are battling in a really difficult time in the world right now um, to try and get a little bit better and, and get into a better place because um, if anyone can be helping anybody at the moment, that's a good thing. Diary of a Flipper has jumped in with a question. He said, what is the end goal for your business? Uh, do you plan to keep pushing reselling to new heights or do you have plans for secondary incomes? I've always got plans for secondary incomes, absolutely, because I think the ultimate uh, way to wealth is to have multiple streams of income. So uh, YouTube is obviously a part or a chain of that, um, obviously the reselling itself. But I've always said with this reselling business, I wanna get it first of all to a point of $50,000 and that's in earnings. So if I can be on 50K, um, take everything out at the end of the day, that's what you earn, 50K a year, that's gonna be the first step. Um, really, I haven't really set any major goals past that. That's the key focus at the moment. I wanna be able to just simply fend for myself, live out of home, earn some money on YouTube, earn some money on reselling, and know that that's enough to get by each and every year. And if I can do that, then I'm, I'm happy. I've only ever done jobs in my, in my past that I've been really passionate about. It's never I've taken the job because of the paycheck that comes along with it. And that's exactly what I'm still doing here today. I'm doing something that I wanna do for the freedom that we just spoke about, but also the, the passion that I've got for making videos and editing videos and getting information across and helping people. Um, doing all of that on, an, on a daily basis and then to have a full-time paycheck from it, that's the goal. It doesn't really go too much further than that. I just need to get it to a point where it's sustainable. Um, so whatever that reselling figure is, um, you know, we'll work it out down the line. But for now, it's just small steps along the way to get to the next target and we'll just see where it ends up. Paul MSR has a question. Paul says, do a lot of the how-to type content American resellers put out carry over to Australia? Does it work there too? Uh, in short, yes, absolutely. I learn a lot of the American resellers. I think there are, well, there are. There are a whole lot more American resellers out there than there are Aussie. In the YouTube world, there's a whole lot more American as well. So yes, absolutely, we do learn off you guys and you've got great content. So I think um, it would really be good to see a lot more Australians uh, so we can learn off people in our own neck of the woods. But for now, uh, it is heavily American dominant. So that's everything, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for sending in your questions. There were quite a few there. Um, hope I haven't dragged on for too long. We'll see how long this video goes for uh, in the edit. But um, I do appreciate it. If I haven't answered your question, like I said, I'll get back to them in the comments uh, on Instagram. But um, thanks very much, guys. I appreciate you tuning into this one. If you do have any other questions yourself, leave them in the comments on this YouTube channel and I will jump into them as well and get an answer back to you. Uh, look forward to catching you in the next video. We're doing a trip. We're tripping to the thrift on Thursday and I'm really looking forward to it. Hope you are too. Until then, guys, we'll see you then. Thanks for tuning into this one. Bye for now.